please rise as you're able and join me for the call to worship. <coughs> People of God, this weekend we celebrate the birth of these United States of America. We gather to rejoice in the liberties offered to us by this nation, to remember those in all times and places who have been true and brave and supplied to our part to make this land a place of welcome and refuge for all. So as we are able and we are risen, let us sing and lift our voices to God. loving God, we thank you for this day, for this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice, and we're glad to be in it. Be with us now on this day, the birth of the nation here of the United States, but be with us now as we worship with you, and through you, through your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. Those are here in person and those who are worshiping with us online, we welcome you and we're glad that you've taken time out of your day to worship with us online. For those who are here in the sanctuary, a few announcements. As you know, we're still uh, using wristbands to uh, distinguish our comfort levels with one another and uh, we continue to do that. A reminder just to make sure you deposit them on the way out so we can sanitize them and reuse them in the future. A uh, reminder that the church office will be closed tomorrow in observance of Independence Day. Um, we'll be back on Tuesday morning, but uh, just in observance of taking the holiday. Today, after worship, we invite you to stick around for um, our, I guess, rebirth of our uh, birthday and anniversary cake fellowship. So um, stick around for some uh, anniversary and birthday cake for those who are celebrating birthdays in July and anniversaries in July. So be a part of that. Um, I invite you to uh, stick around and stick around for the, pray, the postlude as well, excuse me. As you know, we're still um, doing our script cards, so if you are uh, wanting to order script cards, the deadline is the last Sunday of this month, the 25th. Order forms can be uh, located out in the Narthex now, they're the Goldenrod forms. Pick one up and uh, order your script and get it in by the 25th. As you know, we're still um, doing our capital campaign. I'm proud of my church, and of course, this morning we start our sermon series with the same title, I'm Proud of My Church, and you'll hear more about that as we uh, continue with worship. And then our rummage sale, our annual rummage sale will be the 31st of July. It's the last Saturday of the month. 
Um, we will be doing it at the home of Britt Saunders. Um, if you have things that you wish to donate for the rummage sale, please see any board member and they will be happy to make arrangements to receive those goods for you. We also will be uh, taking signups for people to work the rummage sale. I believe sign-up sheets will be up starting next week. And then those of you who um, are new and uh, interested in uh, becoming a member of this congregation or inquiring, um, we will be having a, a new members and inquirers class on Saturday, the 21st of August, so a month and a half from now. But if you are interested in being a part of that or interested in church membership, please see me or contact the church office and we can get you registered or get you information. And with that, as we continue with worship this day, let us hear God's word. Our Hebrew lesson this morning comes from Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, taken from the Inclusive Bible. The voice said, Mere mortals, stand up, and I will speak with you. As it spoke, Spirit entered me and raised me onto my feet, and I heard these words. Mere mortal, I am sending you to the Israelites to be a rebellious to a rebellious nation that revolted against me. They and their ancestors have been rebelling against me and this, till this very day. The people to whom I send you are defiant and stubborn. You are to say to them, thus says the sovereign Yahweh, and whether they listen or they don't, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has come among them. May God bless the hearing of these words. rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel. 
Our gospel lesson this morning comes from John's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 7 through 20, taken from the Inclusive Bible. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. The disciples had gone off to the town to buy provisions. The Samaritan woman replied, You're a Jew. How can you ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? since Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. Jesus answered, If only you recognize God's gift, and who is it that is asking you for a drink? You would have asked him for a drink instead, and he would have given you living water. If you please, she challenged Jesus, you don't have a bucket, and this well is deep. Where do you expect me to get this living water? Surely you don't pretend to be greater than our ancestors Leah and Rachel and Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it with their descendants and flocks. Jesus replied, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give them will never be thirsty. No, the water will give them become foundations within them, springing up to provide eternal life. The woman said to Jesus, Give me this water so that I won't grow thirsty and have to keep coming all the way to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and then come back here. I don't have a husband, replied the woman. You're right, you don't have a husband, Jesus exclaimed. The fact is, you've had five, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. So, what you said is quite true. I can see your prophet, answered the woman. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you people claim that Jerusalem is the place where God ought to be worshipped. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you come to prayer with me this day? Embracing and loving God of so many names, thank you for bringing us together once again. We thank you for letting us come this day so we can proclaim how proud we are of our church and how through your tender mercies and grace that you allow us to be the church and just be who we are. But be with us now as we share the true spirit of Christ that is within each of us and let us continue to be that gift to one another and through your grace and guidance. But let us have our hearts open this morning, but even so, let us have our minds open so that we may be the receptors of the words that are about to be spoken. So I ask now that you touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken on this day, and with the words that come from my mouth, along with the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, let them ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray, amen. I think that some folks don't know that you're really allowed to be proud of your church. I mean, seriously, there are people sitting here or watching online 
who don't have a clue that it's okay to be proud of your church. And if not only is it okay, but you should be proud of your church because everyone's welcome. Today we launch a new ser series that we've titled, I Am Proud of My Church. And over the next several weeks, we will engage in why we should be proud of your church. Yes, your church, Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. We have also paralleled this sermon series with the current capital campaign that we're doing called, I Am Proud of My Church. One of the biggest questions that I continually ask the board is, how do we as a church welcome people as a church? And over the past years, we have taken a careful look of how we welcome new people to our congregation. And I will say that it's safe to say that we do a pretty darn good job of being hospitable to just about anyone. I can safely say that Jesus was one who was proud of his church and loved his church. And while at the same time, Jesus welcomed everyone into his church. We have a God who has loved and welcomes everyone just as well. It's just that simple. There's a saying that some of our biblical scholars have intermingled with their words, and that is having hospitality is making space for someone you don't have to make space for. I think that's a great definition, making space for someone you don't have to make space for. And I say to that because that's what God does. This morning our gospel lesson was out of John, and it was a story that starts at the well where Jesus meets someone and has an encounter. And we are told that Jesus had left Judea and was on his way to Galilee. And we know that on his way, he had to pass through Samaria in either direction, whether you're traveling north or traveling south. We also know that the Israelites are in Judea as well as up in Galilee, and smack dab in the middle of all this, you have the Samarians. And if you remember from previous history, these Samarians were despised by both the folks up in Galilee along with the folks down south in Judea. So these Samarians were being despised on both sides of the territory lines. These Samarians were considered to be inferior. And they originally were full-blooded Jewish people, but a part of the Israelite nation as well but they intermarried with the people from the ancient kingdom of the Assyrians, who had conquered this particular part of the territory about 700 years before the time of Jesus. Here, these Sumerians dressed the wrong way. They believed the wrong stuff. They worshiped in the wrong places. They even were times that they were worshiping in places that they shouldn't. And there was times that the historians tell us that the Sumerians actually aided the Israel enemies in wars against Israel. You could just say that there was some bad blood between the Jews and the Sumerians. So giving you a little back history here, that back in the day when the Jews would travel from the south to the north or vice versa, they would take the long route in order to bypass or having to go through Samaria. I guess you could say that when the rabbis would venture either north or south, they would pull out their Google Maps or their WhatsApp or their Waze app, and they would look at which ways would guide them along this venture, just bypassing or running into those Sumerians. So I guess you could say that their GPS was their form of protection. GPS, geographically protected from Sumerians. GPS. Now, Jesus wasn't going to have any of this and wasn't going to let go out of his way and that he wouldn't take this forever route from Judea to Galilee, Galilee and put up with it. Instead, Jesus takes the direct route on the Samaritan Expressway. He was going to go right through smack dab in the middle through Samaria to get to Galilee. In other words, cut out the nonsense with it taking forever, cutting down on that travel time, and just getting there a whole heck of a lot quicker. Now, I'm sure at this point in this venture, people were thinking something strange is happening here. And if we go back to the Gospel lesson this morning for a moment, that we heard in the Gospel lesson that we started at verse 7. 
But if we go back a few verses here and there, we'll find something interesting in the text that states, he left Judea to return to Galilee. This meant that he passed, he had to pass through Samaria. I find it interesting that this text says he had to go through Samaria. I think people ask the question, why? And it wasn't necessary geographically because people were avoiding this left and right and the rest of the Jews would take that long way around. Some of the gospel writers would even say that he was take, taking it about the will of God and letting it be done. He was actually describing the actions of God, or in this case, Jesus had an appointment in Samaria. While at the same time tackling this weird social dynamic head on, and where people divided are the human race, it was the us versus them scenario. Now, Jesus also divided people up, but what we see is that he divided them into categories. Us versus the soon-to-be us. Or us versus the not yet us. You see, Jesus believed that the dominion of God was a place where everyone's welcomed. As Jesus was passing through Samaria, he comes to a well. This well was in the town called Sychar. It was a well that belonged to Jacob. And if you're not sure who Jacob is, he was one of those three primary Israelite patriarchs. We had Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It was Jacob's 12 sons of which the 12 tribes of Israel were formed. And Jacob was one of those characters that people just found a bit shady. But at the same time, as Jesus was passing through, he was tired as heck and decided to sit down by this well because he was tired. Now, this isn't one of your Jesus superhero stories. This actually is a story about the tired Jesus. But in this case, God is actually going to use Jesus' tiredness and weariness to set the story. If you check Paul's writings, he puts it like this, that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. So we have Jesus here sitting at the well because you know they didn't have gay bars and they didn't have the eShalom or the JewishMingle.com and that day gathering at the well was where people met other people. And of course this is going to be one of those stories where individual meets individual which means you don't have to go any further than the Old Testament in order to see how this all turns out. This is one of those scenarios where everyone knows that the place to meet others was at the well. And back in the day, these well stories were actually the boy meets girl, the boy meets boy, and the girl meets girl kind of stories. But this is Jesus. So that's the wrong boy. And we're in Samaria. Well, that's the wrong place. And then all of a sudden, remember now, this is a well story. So then the woman comes, and of course, this is the wrong woman. So here's where we pick up with our story and what we heard in the gospel lesson this morning. It was about noon when a Sumerian woman came to draw water. Now in that part of the ancient world and in many parts of the world today, getting water is a daily thing, but very difficult as well as being difficult, yet very menial in its task. But we know from the story that this woman was more than likely getting water for herself, and from this, she probably may have been struggling financially, which means not only is she the wrong ethnicity, and possibly even the wrong religion. So we're told that she comes up about high noon. Now we gotta keep in mind that there's something wrong with that part of the story that it's actually the wrong time of day to draw water. But Jesus said to her anyway, give me a drink. So here the Sumerian woman, knowing that Jesus wasn't one of those Sumerians, says to Jesus, you're a Jew, and I'm a Sumerian woman. How can you ask me, yes me, for a drink? Remember now, these folks were the best of buddies back in the day, and she's like saying, dude, how can you tell me that a Jewish person has the audacity to ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water? 
I mean, this is one of those classic us versus them mentalities. And probably in her mind and in her world, this made sense to her all because not only is she the wrong everything, she's showing up at the wrong time of day to put the icing on the cake. She was also the wrong gender. You have to remember, this is one of those big deals in the ancient Middle Eastern culture. Men did not talk to women in those days, especially in public places. This was this clear line that it was not welcoming and a, or a welcoming environment. And once again, it was displaying that we versus them mentality. So you have to understand that this was a pivotal time as Jesus is about to tell one of the most famous stories about this guy who got beat up. And there were Jewish priests who came right beside him, who blows right back, and this man, and then this ancient hero of the story, and if you remember that story from back when, it was the individual ending up being the Good Samaritan. These are classic Jesus stories and classic Jesus treating people on the other side. And if they're on the, on the other side, Jesus seemed to love the Samarians. Jesus ends up having the longest record conversation in the Gospels with this Samarian woman, and longer than he had with anyone else. This whole story seems to suddenly have this mysterious invitation of this living water conversation that takes this major left turn and turns into a go call your spouse conversation. If you recall, he says, go call your husband. The main thing we need to hear about the story today is that everyone has a story. And everyone's story has some messy parts and it has some good parts. But I also want to share a little about what Jesus saw and sees when looking at someone and what it has to do with that idea, everyone's welcome. Understand that the disciples at this point looked at this woman and they saw someone who was wrong. They saw someone who was different. But Jesus looked at her and saw somebody that he loved. There's also another Samaritan story within the Gospels that we probably should include as well. It was one day when Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And this time he's going in the opposite direction. He's going from the south, from, going from the south of Galilee excuse me, going from the north of Galilee down to Jerusalem. Got that backwards. And you know that he was taking the Samaritan Expressway once again. He wasn't going to take the long route. But this time he wanted to spend the night in a Samaritan village. But the Samaritans in this particular place weren't going to have it. They didn't welcome Jesus. They, were rolling, they weren't rolling out the red carpet or showing him any hospitality. And at the same time, a few of his disciples weren't very happy with him and say to Jesus, why don't you just throw down some fire from heaven and destroy these people? <laughs> you know they could do that in that day. <laughs> and here they thought that Jesus would affirm their zealousness, saying, yo, Jesus, we're here, take the stand here, and just go torch the place down, and know that the people who all do this, that it'll just be taken care of. But you know, people who claim to follow Jesus more than likely have thought similar things for centuries. But when things like this happen, Jesus would turn to his followers and rebuke them and correct them. And I'm sure he probably looked into the sky and said and muttered, really now, are you kidding me, God? These are the people you want me to change the world with? Jesus had to actually protect these Sumerians from his followers. But chew on this for a moment. Being right puts me on the opposite side of people I disagree with. But love puts me on the same side as people I disagree with as well. Kind of powerful. <laughs> love brings people together, but being right polarizes. Jesus always looks at the people with love, and because, as we heard earlier, everyone has a story. And everyone's story has its messy parts. But instead, running from the people, Jesus ran to the people. Do you remember the definition of hospitality that I shared a little earlier? 
Hospitality is making space for someone you don't have to make space for. We are a church that is not the them versus us kind of church. We are not a church that puts the line down through the middle of the room and says, okay, you people over stand over here and you people stand over there. But we are the church that is loving, a church that was started for people who were marginalized, who were oppressed, who were not welcomed anywhere else in society. We are the church that says, I am proud of my church because everyone is welcomed here. You are welcomed here, and you are welcomed here, and you are welcomed here. And as Upper says, you get a car, and you get a car, and everybody gets the car. You are all welcomed in this place. And you know that not everyone knows that until someone invites them, right? So I challenge you this week. We are having, when having a conversation with someone who you know possibly isn't connected to a church or isn't connected to something that they should be connected to, maybe say to them, I am proud of my church. I am proud of Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church because you should come to church with me someday. You may be taking or talking to someone that you discover in this new era that is looking you have, or you have that inkling that they might be looking for a faith community because they've been separated and so far apart. Especially as we come out of this COVID scenario, so many people have been turning to their faith. So why not invite them to come to church with you? As we all know, we are celebrating 50, yes, 50 vibrant, inclusive, progressive years of being this community of faith and a community of faith that has always proclaimed that we are proud of our church. Everyone is welcomed in this place. So you're going to hear over the next how many months about coming and joining the celebration, coming and being proud of this church, of who we are and what we do and how we do it out into the world. Stand up and be proud of who you are, but be proud of your church at the same time. So I bring blessings to each of you this morning, Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. You are welcomed in this place. Amen. We come to time of offering. If you haven't already filled out your green keeping in touch card and any prayer request, you can do that while I'm talking. Put it in the basket or give it to any board member if you don't get it done before the baskets come around. So... There's lots of ways to be proud of your church, but we also have to support our church. And we do that through our tithing. So whether it's something you put in the basket every Sunday, or you mail yours in, or you go to PayPal or the website to do it, or you monthly give, all of those things are very much appreciated. And we, as always, promise to put it to good use. There's lots of other ways, I said this last Sunday, I'm gonna keep saying it, that you can give to your church besides just monetarily. So whether you would like to be a greeter in the morning on Sundays, whether you would like to help with coffee hour or clean up after coffee hour or just straighten up the church after service, there's all sorts of ways that you can give of your talents. The rummage sale that's coming up is obviously very important and we're gonna need help with that, of people sitting at the table and taking money and help setting it up. So whatever you can do with that. And there's lots of other ways that you'll hear as we prepare for our anniversary and other things. So I don't want you thinking that we just want your money. Obviously we do in order to pay the bills, okay? But we want your talents as well. So pastor has sent out your giving statements this week so you should be receiving those in the mail if you don't see them obviously it's a holiday but if you don't see them by next sunday please let pastor one of the board members know and we'll reprint it for you
So as we prepare to come to the table this morning, for those of you that are watching online, if you haven't already done so, we invite you to go and get your communion elements so you can be a part of this wonderful meal that we're about to celebrate. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts you provide of the bread and the fruit of the vine. Let the bread we break and the cup we bless speak to us of the presence of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who follow Christ's way, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. We know it was in that moment in the upper room on that night that Jesus was to be taken from us. As he gathered with his disciples, he took the bread at the end of the meal, blessed it and broke it, and gave thanks and said to them to take and to eat, for this is my body given for you. And as often as you eat from this, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, following the meal, he took the cup from the table. This is the cup that he says was a new covenant of my life poured out for each and all people for the forgiveness of sin. Drink from this often, and as often as you drink from this, do so in remembrance of me. And so with this bread and this cup, we remember your word dwelling among us full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in Christ's death and resurrection and offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Will you please pray with me? So now in this place where we have heard your promises among these people in whom we have seen the Christ, pour your spirit upon these gifts of your table. The broken bread of life is all we need of hope fulfilled. And as we go forth to anoint the lost and the hopeless with the oil of your compassion, your cup of grace overflows more than we will ever need and more than enough to bring healing to those who have known only the hardship, the rejection, and the loneliness. And when at the end of all time we discover that who you have led us to be and who had led us all along the way and brought us to the table in glory, we will join our voices singing our praises to you, God in community, holy in one. Amen.
out into the world this day, and as we go into the world, I invite you to, to after the benediction and sending to have a seat and listen to the postlude because it's a wonderful postlude that Brendan has, but then following that, join us in the community room for coffee and cake. But as we go out into the world of this day, let us go out into the world of this day through God's tender mercies and grace and protection that is given to each and every one of us. And let us go out into the world knowing that we are proud of who we are. So as we go out into the world of this day and each and every day, let us go out into the world through God the Creator, God the Savior, and God the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.